morning, West Gate. Would you stand as we prepare to go to worship? I just have one verse from Genesis that I'd love to read for us. This is as much for me, maybe, as, as it can be helpful to you. I find sometimes, even as a professional Christian, um, I come to church on Sunday, and it takes me it takes me a minute to shake off the week. And sometimes on the best days of worship, there's this moment where I feel like I've been able to just kind of clear the dust off of myself and go, okay, Lord, there you are. And I'd like, I'd like to find that sooner than later this morning. I wonder if you're in the same boat. Um, this is one verse, Genesis 21. This is kind of in the middle of the narrative of Abraham who takes up a huge amount of Genesis, this guy who's promised kids that outnumber the stars basically and for decades that promise goes unfulfilled and somewhere along this journey it says Abraham planted a tamarisk tree at Beersheba and there he worshipped the Lord the eternal God and Abraham lived as a foreigner in the Philistine country for a long time and I just I just want to go behind one of those words how, how Abraham refers to God he calls him the eternal God God. And this this is what that word this is what that word means. That word in Hebrew is Elolam means the God of eternity, the everlasting God, the God without a beginning. And then here's where it starts to get really interesting. The God who will never cease to be, the God who will never grow old, the God to whom eternity is what present time is. I'm going to say that one more time. El Olam. Abraham is describing this God to whom eternity is what present time is. Describes God as he who extends beyond our greatest version or vision of who we think God is. No matter how great our concept of God, he's always greater. Wow. So, Lord, as we prepare to worship you, El Olam, one of the many, many names that you have allowed yourself to be known by. God, even with all of our vocabulary and all of our experience and all the moments that we could point to and say, God, you walked with me there or you showed up there. It falls so short to describe who you are and what happens as you turn your face towards your children. Your word says, when we worship you, you give us your attention and you draw near to us. So God, we lean into that promise as we dust ourselves off from the week and we present ourselves to you. Lord, we're holding on to that promise. If we seek you, with all of our heart, we'll find you. So here we come, Lord. Here we come. We're ready to find you this morning. Amen. Let's worship. How appropriate these words are. Let's sing them together. All my words fall short. All my words fall short I've got nothing new How could I express All my gratitude I could sing these songs As I often do But every song must stay
just lift up your voice in a hallelujah right now. Hallelujah. We worship you. And hallelujah. 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 We bring.
Things are Your plan. 
He's created us for intimacy. Would you just adore him right now? Oh, how we love you, Jesus. Oh, how we adore you. up your hands all across this building just worship him we're changing the whole set this morning we're just making space for the lord we're trying to find words what holy spirit what would you have us say to the father holy spirit what would you how would you have us adore jesus today we just join in that process right now we're all up here just waiting on the lord lord what what praise do you desire today what do you want to do in our hearts today god we want to make room for you jesus oh how we love We love you. Oh, how we love you. Oh, you are the one. Our hearts adore. Oh, the joy I
hands. We just worship him all across the building. Oh, Lord, all of this is yours, Jesus. All of our lives, all of our families, Jesus, we worship you, Lord. You can all, this in the reality that this good good God doesn't ask for our perfection he doesn't ask for our performance he doesn't ask for our achievement he asks for our humility he asks for our surrender he asks for our brokenness and our mess and he says, that's the place that I'm near. The brokenhearted, I'm close to those people. The proud, they won't let me in. I know this is a strange, a strange sentence to hear, but can we even, can we bless our brokenness? Because that's the fertile ground where Jesus comes. And he starts to work. And he pulls the rocks out and he pulls the weeds out and he puts the seeds that only he has into the ground and he watches it and he tends it and he watches it and he guards it and he tends it and he waters it and then growth comes not from our accomplishment not from our achievement but from our brokenness from our willingness to hold ourselves before the Father and say, I am an imperfect field. But I'm willing for you to work on me. Even though I can't imagine what it would be like 
to produce a harvest. Because I felt dry for so long. Oh, Jesus, come. Meet us in our brokenness this morning. Can you ask Jesus at yourself? Your words, your voice. If you can muster it just loud enough so your ears can hear your lungs. Ask Jesus to come to that place of brokenness. It's a good thing that you don't have anything to offer here. It's a good thing. You've given him this morning all that he wants already. You've given him your worship. Jesus, as we invite you in to those broken and weary places, Father, would your peace start to fall on us right now in this moment from the inside to the out. Not peace based on external circumstances, but unassailable peace that's from you and you alone. The peace that comes when you pour your spirit so richly over us. You fill us up. You displace the lies of the enemy. There's nowhere else for them to go but out because perfect light casts out darkness and perfect love overcomes fear. Jesus, help us hold on to this moment with you as we move on in service, as we move on in our day today, as we move on in our weekend month. Jesus, help us not to forget these moments when you're true to your promises when you inhabit the praises of your people, when you're close to those who are broken. Mark this in our spirits. Remind us in the moments that we need it. Amen. Amen, you can be seated. never ever ever know how to move from these moments in service so in our entire not knowing how to move can you just take a deep breath with me we'll watch our video announcements and we'll continue on Westgate Chapel, where together we are knowing God, being transformed, and doing His work. Women of Westgate, our annual conference, Awaken, is here. Join us on Friday, April 26th, and Saturday, April 27th, for an amazing weekend filled with worship and the word brought to us by Pastor Vanessa Hunt. On Saturday, Children's Ministries will provide childcare, and we will also enjoy an amazing lunch prepared by Chef John. The cost is $50. Visit westgatechapel.com to register today. The following have applied for membership at Westgate Chapel. Are you interested in becoming a member? Visit westgatechapel.com to learn more. We are excited to host special guest Mike Pompeo for our next Apologia Forum on Sunday, April 14th at 6 p.m. We've, we've, we've got deterrence lost in Europe. We have deterrence lost in the Middle East. We are on the cusp of losing that very deterrent model in Asia as well. One could argue that elements of that have already been lost. Chairman Kim, who I spent way too much time with. Uh, Chairman Kim has now talked about the absence of any desire for peaceful reunification with the Republic of Korea. That is a change that is important. I was in Guyana two weeks ago. They are frightened by Maduro and his efforts to retake, in his words, much as Xi Jinping talks about reunifying, retake what is rightfully theirs. This is a challenge uh, that is linked not just about one of these theaters, one of these zones, one of these regions, but these are all deeply linked to whether America will have the resolved determination and capacity to deter and maintain the order 
that we have benefited, that Americans have benefited from since the post-Cold War order was established. Mike Pompeo is the former U.S. Secretary of State, Director of the CIA, and outspoken defender of Christian conservative values. We will be discussing domestic and international events and America's standing on the global stage. Doors will open at 5 p.m., admission is free, and all are welcome. Mark your calendar. This will be one you won't want to miss. Here at Westgate Chapel, there are three ways to give. Online at westgatechapel.com, by dropping a giving envelope in the giving boxes in the lobby as you leave today, or by texting WGC and your giving amount to 73256. God bless you as you give. For more information, please visit us at westgatechapel.com. Thank you for joining us. We pray that you are experiencing the presence of God today as we seek him together. Okay. This would normally be the part of the service where I introduce myself. Hi, my name's Eric. I'm on staff here. I know it's a big church. It can be hard to get connected. I'd love to meet you. I'll be at the information or uh, the connection hub after service. So all that is true. And I, I realized something this morning that usually when I'm hosting service, I make sure to try to add that in because I really, truly, gen this Westgate's a big church and it's hard to know people. And so if there's anything I can do to help shrink it, I wanna be that person if I can. But also I realize as I've met people over the years, people go, yeah, I'm just trying to get connected. And I go, okay, well, who, who can I connect you to? What group can I connect you to? Who, you know, we can maybe invite you to a Tuesday night, can eat dinner, whatever. Um, and I realize what I actually need is some help. And so what I'm wondering, Westgate, is um, instead of that moment where uh, I might come up and say, hey, can you turn around and greet the people around you? And uh, we're always kind of like all thumbs and pinkies and awkward handshakes. I, I wonder if a, a more meaningful alternative would be this, is when you are in the coming and going, when you're in the lobby, when you're in the parking lot, even if it was just one person a month who you didn't know, they may have been at Westgate for 40 years and you've sat three rows away from them and you've just never known that. Or they might be brand new, but can you just identify somebody, especially if you know somebody with that, that deer in the headlights look that we've all had at one moment or another, like that, where is the bathroom? I have to go so bad. Oh my word, I can't figure it out. And for you to be able to just come up and just simply say this, hey, I haven't met you yet. And it can be a 10 second conversation. They go, oh my gosh, do you know where the bathroom is? And you're like, oh yeah, it's over there. And they go sprinting off and that might be it, right? Um, or it could lead to something more. Um, can you help me in that regard? Okay, thank you. That said, there is something we're gonna take, we're gonna take two minutes and we're all gonna do this. So in the seat back in front of you, there's a connection card. These have been lurking a foot away from you and we just haven't talked about them in a long time. So everybody, could you pull these out? We're going to take a look at it together. We're going to do this. I'm going to do it with you. Okay, so what I'm going to ask is this one of the ways that as this, the, one of the meager ways that we try to shrink, shrink the bigness of Westgate is by at least having decent contact information so that we can get a hold of you. When you go, hey, I need prayer, we go, great, but you didn't leave a return phone number and I have no idea how to call you back and get a hold of you. Um, also, so we can reach you about your car's extended warranty, uh, just kidding, that's a joke, we're not gonna do that. Um, but, so if, could you pull this out? There should be a pen if you wanna do the, the, the ink solution, great, but there's also a QR code if you just wanna pull out your phone and type this out on your phone. And if you can just fill out as much information as you can. Now, this, now some of you might be thinking, Eric, you know me, right? We, we, we've gone to church together for years. I still want you to do this with me, okay? I realized as, as I was doing this in preparation for this morning that uh, I got married a bit ago, and Realm didn't know that. And so I went to my Realm account, and I looked at my wife, I was like, babe, you wanna get married? <laughs> and so now we're married on Realm, so, so you know who I'm married to, which is great. So, okay, so grab this out, let's start filling it out. I didn't bring a pen up, I did bring a pen up, so I'm gonna do it. it feels wrong to do this on a communion table, so I'm just gonna do this on the back of my hand here. Okay, we're all doing this. Name, email, phone number. No peeking for answers, okay? <laughs> Unless you're sitting next to somebody and they're cute and you haven't met them yet, then that's okay.
And if you are, sorry, I'm just, I don't know what else to do to fill the space, so I'm gonna just make jokes. And if you are cute and you're sitting next to a grandma, she might be peeking over to get your information for her grandson or granddaughter, so that's okay too. We have some of those here. They're very nice. Feel sorry for the usher that gets this connection card from me. I missed my calling, I should have been a doctor. Okay, on the back side, there's one really, really important thing here. Um, prayer reports, praise requests, this is a chance for you to go, hey, I don't know who to call or who to ask, but I need some prayer. That, that This actually gets, this, something happens when you write on this and turn it in, okay? This doesn't just get sorted into the trash can, I promise. But there's these boxes, and there's one particular box that says, I've decided to be baptized. That one's important because our next baptism service is happening at two, two, two or three weeks. April 28th happens in both services. And yes, you can show up on the morning of, but it always works a little bit better if you get signed up ahead of time. So with your information freshly here, and if you feel some prompting from the Lord, you know what? I, I haven't been baptized. I'd, li I'd like to get baptized. That, that's something that the Lord asks and encourages and commands us as followers of him to do. Representing the old is gone, the new is come. So put a little check mark by that, be baptized. Now, ushers are coming. Could you take this, pass it to the aisle, and they'll come by and scoop these up, but we'll move on in service. You, I need this for a second service. Yeah, okay. Okay. I'll trust that you got that done with a QR code or you got it done in person. Those always live, we're not gonna do this every week, those always live in the seat in front of you and the spot you can always drop them if you don't see or know an usher is there's little lock, little black lock boxes for offering and connection cards right as you exit on the right or left side of the door that you can drop those into, okay? Thanks for taking a couple moments to administrate that with me. Let me just pray over our offering and we're gonna continue in service. Father, thank you, wow, thank you for the richness that you have had in this morning for us. Thank you for what's to come. God, I think of that, that scripture that says, you prepare for us a feast in the presence of our enemies. Just wondering how many of us have, are in that battle facing those enemies, yet, Lord, you have a feast for us this morning. Thank you for that. Bless this offering as we give, amen. a hope for all the suffering, a song of joy for all who weep. There is an anchor for the stumbling, a mighty fortress to Your 
would you stand with me? Lord, as we just sang, unto you, Lord, unto you be all glory. Lord, today as we come, we do everything, Lord, everything we bring, our voices, our hearts, our giving, Lord, it's for you to be glorified. It's unto you. And God, what an incredible savior you are that when we come to give you glory, we come to give you honor, we come to establish in our hearts who you are, God, that in the midst of that, Lord, you're the one that keeps us and you're the one that holds us and you finish what you've started in us. Lord, you are so worthy of all praise today. Lord, every song we sang, every prayer we prayed, Lord, you're worthy. And now, God, as we go to the word, Lord, you're worthy of our hearing. Lord, you're worthy of us listening, Lord, with the intent to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. So, God, we submit ourselves now to your word. We listen with ears to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Pastor Alec is taking some vacation. He'll be back with us next week for um, Sunday morning and then also for Apologia. And as, you know, as I got ready this morning or as I was getting ready this week for this morning, I was just prayerfully asking the Lord, coming out of a weekend like last weekend, I don't know how many of you were at the Good Friday service and then on Easter, where it just felt the Lord met us so strongly. His presence was so powerful on Sunday. And it felt like, wow, this, this is not tradition. This is God meeting his people and the power of God on display. Uh, it felt like from the very first note. And so I felt especially... Um, responsible to hear what then the what what would the lord say after that what would be his follow up jesus what do you want us to know from your heart this Sunday. How do you wanna reveal yourself to us? We've been celebrating your resurrection. What's next? And this phrase came to my heart right away and it was the first words of Jesus. Look at the first words of Jesus. And so I got out my Bible and I thought, okay, I wanna look at the first words of Jesus coming out of the wilderness. So the first words of his ministry. And we know there's four gospels that record different aspects of his ministry. So I just thought, I'm gonna look at all four and let's see what those first words that the disciples felt were important enough to record as Jesus's first words of his ministry. So let's just look at them real quickly, and then I'm going to go into what I felt like the Lord was saying. So Matthew, we're going to start with Matthew, the first gospel, because I just did it in order. You know, I'm just trying to like, okay, Lord, I'm ready to unpack. And it, what's that scripture? It's the glory of God to hide a matter and the glory of kings to, to search it out. It's like God loves to give us hints, and then he says, will you come with me into this adventure? So Matthew 4 Chapter 17, or flip that, Matthew 4, verse 17. Jesus' first words. It says, from then on, Jesus began to preach. Here it is. Repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Okay, now let's look at Mark. What did Jesus say? The first recorded words of Jesus' ministry in Mark. Mark chapter one. I, I would just totally encourage you to follow along. So grab, there's a Bible in front of you or do this on your phone. Mark chapter one, verse 15. I'm reading from the NLT version. So your version might say it a little bit differently, but the first sentence of Jesus' ministry in Mark chapter one in verse 15. 15, Jesus says, the time promised by God has come at last. The time promised by God has come at last. Okay, now next is Luke. So let's go over to Luke 
chapter four and verse 18 records the first words of Jesus in the book of Luke were this. Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released and the blind will see and the oppressed will be set free and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. All right, last one is John, right? That's the last gospel. John chapter one records Jesus' first words of his ministry. The disciples, Andrew and John, are following him. So the one who's recording this was following Jesus just at the very beginning, trying to figure out who he is. And Jesus looked and saw them. They weren't disciples yet. He looked and saw them. It says in verse 38, and this is what Jesus said, what do you want? Or other, other translations say, what are you seeking? They replied, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And Jesus said, come and see. So two things, Jesus said, what are you seeking? And then the invitation, come and see. So here's the four first words of Jesus recorded by the gospels. And I wrote them out. Part of my uh, study practice for preaching is I have these giant post-it notes that are like as big as this pulpit. And I put them up on the wall and I use color-coded markers. And I wrote the words of Jesus in red, you know, like, like they are in many of our Bibles. And I just, I did four different giant sticky notes across the extra bedroom in our basement. And from Matthew to John, I put all four of those statements of Jesus. And then I just said, Holy Spirit, what are you saying? And that's my favorite part of the sermon prep process is that when the Holy Spirit starts to ignite something that otherwise might seem random or you're not sure the meaning, I mean, it's like like this trend right now on social media, I don't know if you've seen, where people have random words, this, a songwriter will say, give me four random words. And someone will just, on the sidewalk, will just give them four random words. And then they'll use that as a challenge and come up with a song. Have you seen this? Okay, I just, this has nothing to do with the sermon, but I thought this was fun. Because when I see this, I'm like, this is what it's like sermon prepping. Only the songwriter is the Holy Spirit. And I feel like I'm bringing the random things and then the Holy Spirit. So, okay, so Ruth, Will you just just show everybody what I'm talking about so they have context? Following the Lord is that fun. And you take what you feel like he's given you and then you just watch to see what he does. And as you watch, I feel like that guy on the couch, like you start to lean in and bounce with it and you recognize what he's doing and it gets exciting. And that happened for me in this scripture. In case you think I'm being like too flippant or something, the Bible does say every word of God is God breathed and useful for teaching. And it, but it takes the Holy Spirit to enliven his word. That's why we should never read the word without inviting the Holy Spirit to enliven the word to us so that essentially what happens is we come off the couch because we recognize the spirit is in that and speaking directly to our hearts. So I had these sticky notes up on the wall and I just said, Holy Spirit, what are you saying today to the church, today to Westgate Chapel through what you said 2,000 years ago at those different parts of your ministry, but the recorders of your ministry felt important to record them as your first words. What are you saying? And here's what I sensed. He rearranged them for me. And I started with John. So I started with Jesus's invitation because Jesus always comes with an invitation. Jesus is invitational. He's always calling us in. He's calling us in, inviting us to come, come, come. And he says to Andrew and to John, he says, what are you seeking? What are you seeking? 
So I would say to you today, what is the ache of your heart? What are you seeking? What are you looking for? And Jesus's invitation is come and see, come and see. There will always be more power to a lived experience with Jesus. And so he's inviting you to come and see, come and see who I am, come and I think what's interesting is that at the end of verse 39, John says that they, specifically the time of day, he says it was about four o'clock in the afternoon. And a lot of the different people I was reading, what they said about that verse, they start arguing about, well, did he really mean four o'clock? Was that Roman time or Jewish time? And they got caught up in the exact time of day. But one person noted, I don't think it's this specific as what John experienced in Jesus, what he had been invited into and then experienced so marked him that he never forgot the exact time where he first encountered Jesus. So the word of the Lord to us coming out of Easter, what Jesus purchased on the cross, we celebrated at Good Friday and the power of the resurrection on Sunday. He now invites all of us, come and see, there's more. There's more to this. Would you come and experience me? And if you will take him at his word and follow after him, start to seek the Lord and lean into what he's calling you into. Like John, you will be so marked by Jesus that you will remember the time and the date and the moment that he comes after you. That's the first, come and see. It's an invitation from heaven. Today, there is an invitation from heaven for all of us of Jesus saying, come and see what I'm about. Come in deeper, come in longer. Some of you have followed him for 40 years, 50 years, 60 years. The time doesn't matter. He's always inviting you to come and see. It's never boring following Jesus. Come and see. Then the Lord showed me the next piece he wanted to talk about was Mark chapter one. So move over to Mark chapter one again in verse 15. The first words of Jesus, the time promised by God has come at last. So if we put those together, Jesus's invitation is to you is come and see because there's a time. Right now, the Greek word for that is a kairos moment. It means an opportunity. There is an opportunity, a window in this time and space. I believe, and I know many of you do too, that we are living in some pretty crazy times. But as it feels like there's more shaking and darkness around us than ever before, the Lord is saying there is a time There is a Kairos moment in the middle of this where I want to get your attention. It's a promised time that you're entering into. It's a specific time, an opportunity I have for you to come and see and to come in deeper with me, to not get caught up in what's going on around you, but to come and see because it's a time promised by God in this moment. So yes, he said this 2,000 years ago, but look at me, there is a time today, the fact that you're in this room, the Holy Spirit would say this time right now, this is a specific time and alarms are going off to prove that this is a time. I'm not kidding, it probably is true. Okay, we'll just take a second. Interesting because the message translation says time's up. (laughs) And trumpets start sounding. (laughs) I think it's prophetic. I mean, I'll just be real. That stuff's not accidental. The Lord's trying to get your attention. Jesus says, come and see because time's up. What does that mean to us today? If the Spirit's saying that that is what he wants to say today, in this moment, what does he mean, time's up? Do you feel it? Do you sense the urgency? Because I do. There's an urgency in the time we're in, in the day we're in, where Jesus is saying, you're getting close. Time's about to be up. 
don't miss this window of opportunity to come in deeper with me, to come in with me and to do what, I, what I'm calling you into, that experience that I'm calling you into, that deeper place that I'm calling you into. Is it possible to miss the window? Yes. Or the urgency wouldn't be there. Jesus wouldn't go to the lengths he goes to to get our attention if there wasn't a chance that you and I could miss it. After all these years of serving him, could we, could we miss it? Yes. Ask the churches in Revelation who had gone so far and been through so much and yet several of them were at the point just that God was saying, look, you have a t- small window here a time, an opportunity to turn and repent because time's up and you might lose it if you don't take the Kairos moment that's right in front of you. There are some of you who have come in this room because this is what you do on Sundays is you come here or you're coming with a friend that you feel obligated to be here. And I just would say to you right now, the Lord is saying time's up You're here for a reason, pay attention. Pay attention to the timing of God because it's a promised time. It's something he has been looking forward to. Even the fact that you would hear these words, that you would hear his words is something that he's been looking forward to and planning that on April 7th, I'm gonna go after his heart. I'm gonna go after her heart one more time and say, this is it. Don't walk out without paying attention. The next scripture I want to go to is Luke chapter 4. What is on the other side of this opportunity? What is Jesus calling us into experience? Well, he tells us in the first words in Luke chapter 4, he's in the synagogue in Nazareth, and he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. The spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has anointed me to bring good news. So even in the urgency of times up, Jesus is saying, this is good news for you. This is good news for you because I'm coming to those who are poor, those who feel like they don't have any more to give, those who feel like they are at the end of themselves, I have goodness on the other side. He sent me to proclaim that captives will be released. Captives can be translated into prisoners. Prisoners are typically those who are guilty, right? So those who are guilty have release. This is what Jesus does. Some of you have walking around with guilt that is there legitimately. Look, we are all sinners. We carry the weight of our sin. And Jesus says, yes, you got yourself there. You carry that guilt rightly. Some of the shame you carry is there because you have done wrong. And yet, Jesus says, there's release for you. I'm here to bring you release from that guilt, release from that shame. Just because you're guilty of it doesn't mean you have to live under it. Jesus says, I am coming to tell you, captives will be released and the blind will see. If you feel like you are in a spot of confusion, you can't tell what is going on around you, what's up, what's down, what's right, what's wrong. It feels like your your gaze is totally blurry. The Lord would say, I can give you sight. I wanna give you sight. In a time where it even feels like the darkness around us makes it hard to see, Jesus says, I can give you eyes that will see. This is the invitation of Jesus. Will you come and experience me? This is the time. And the oppressed will be set free. Those who are burdened, those who are broken, you will experience freedom because look at this, here it is again. The time of the Lord's favor has come. The time has come. There are these windows of time where the Lord says, this is what I wanna do. And he invites you, will you come and see? 
And then lastly, I want to go to Matthew because this is how. Jesus says, come and see because the time is now. I wanna free you. I wanna release you. I wanna give you vision. I wanna put my favor on you. But this is how you walk into that. Jesus preached verse 17 in chapter four of Matthew. His first words in the gospel of Matthew are repent of your sins and turn to God for the kingdom of heaven is near. Repent of your sins. These are his first words in the gospel of Matthew. Repent of your sins and turn to God for the kingdom of heaven is near. The idea of the nearness of the kingdom, other translations say it's here. But you know how something can be here, it can be near and here, but I have to do something to access it, to experience it, to step into it. And Jesus is saying the kingdom of heaven is right here. It's right in front of you. This is the time. Are you gonna come and see it? But how do you step out and reach for it? How do you step into all that he wants to pour into your life, all that he says he is, all that he's anointed to bring to your life? He tells us in Matthew, the way that you enter in is you repent of your sins and you turn to God. So let's just unpack that for a minute because the word repent carries a lot of baggage. But I want to redeem the word repent to you because it shouldn't be a hard word for us. Another way of saying repent is change your mind, change your heart, change your life. And if we believe that this is good news, then it's like Jesus's invitation to step into a way of being that will actually bring us freedom and bring us life, but we can only access it if we let go of the things we've clung to so tightly. So Jesus says, you have to turn to God and repent of your sins. You, when did you say, Jesus, I am sinful? That's part of entering into the kingdom. That is so offensive to our modern ears. When did you last say, Jesus, I'm not enough? In fact, if I'm left to my own ways, I will ruin my life and the people around me. This is what it means to repent of your sins, is being aware of, identifying, and then being ready to say, Lord, I let it all go because what you're saying must be more true than who I have been. And I'd rather have what you're doing. I'd rather have what you're saying. I'd rather have the ways that you walk than what I've done. Look how it's worked out for me. Look how the things I've held on to, the securities I've longed for, the, the ways that I've protected myself. It's not help. So I've got to repent of my ways. Let me just show you what, I tried to think of a way to illustrate this. Again, I'm just trying to help. I think repentance sometimes feels like we, we don't wanna hear it because we think of like an angry preacher. But we have to be okay with this word because it's the way you get in. This is what Jesus said. So we have, to, we have to change our mind. He says, my ways are higher than your ways. That word repentance, that word repent, that's just offensive. Jesus will offend us. He will offend you. Think about what did he do with the rich man? The rich man who came and he said, Jesus, I've done everything, every commandment I've followed. What do I have to do to get into the kingdom of God? Jesus went for the one thing that would offend him. He said, sell everything. And the man hung his head and walked away. So it was the one thing Jesus went after. Did he do that to every single disciple? No, but he'll go into our lives and he'll push on that one thing that we will not let go of because he knows the freedom that will come. He knows the blessing that will come, yes? 
Okay, I'm just gonna pray right now because I feel like, um, not to pull you into too much of my experience, but I feel right now like what I know the Lord is saying is not getting translated. So let's just invite him in to help us. So Jesus, we just invite your presence right now. We even just, Lord, I, uh, I'm hearing all these alarms going off and uh, I just invite you to come. Lord, this is your word. This is what it means to walk with you. And Lord, I know that this is, a, in a sense, Lord, this could be um, the word that could make or break somebody's walk with you because of what you're calling us into, all of us. So Lord, we just invite you, Jesus. Come Holy Spirit, come Holy Spirit, come anoint your word. Come anoint your word in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Okay, let me show you something. There's, there's this picture of a church in Bethlehem, actually, uh, where they say, and, and I don't know for sure, but they say that underneath this church is the cave where Jesus was born. So they have built a church on top of it. What really struck me and is significant is that the doorway into this church, you can tell the scale of the, of the tour guide that's standing next to the door. The scale of the door is, is very short. So the only way to enter into this church is to bend over. And the reason why they did that is because of Jesus's, uh, the way that he came to Bethlehem, he came in humility. And he showed us what it is to be the kingdom of God. You have to come low, right? They came to Mary. Mary was low and humble. And so Jesus says, like, come in low, right? So they did this doorway. So I was thinking about this image when I was thinking about what God's saying when he says, repent. Repent and come in. Because think about, okay, think about behind this door, I put in little words there, I put the kingdom of God. Imagine that through that doorway is every promise of God fulfilled. It's everything that he declared in Luke that he is and that he has for us. He said, oppressed will be set free. Blind eyes will see. That's the kingdom of God is just through that that door. It's just through that door. You can't see it. But if you could just get through that door, it would be like the Garden of Eden exploding in front of you. Every purpose of God fulfilled. The kingdom of God is near, Jesus said, right? The kingdom of God is near. So when you're standing at that doorway, it's near. It is right there. But the only way that I can access it and guys, this is, this is a lifestyle Christianity. This isn't just for those of you who have never first entered the kingdom, which I pray that through this message, you would hear Jesus's invitation to come and see. But for every single one of us, those of you that have been members at this church for decades, this is a lifestyle Christianity that says, if you want to enter the kingdom of God, you must repent. You have to get low. Any crowns you put on your head have to come off or that doorway is gonna knock you over. Jesus is the doorway. He's the only way in, right? He's the way, the truth, and the life. That's the word of God to us. That's what he says about himself. The cross and the resurrection purchased a way for us. The door's open. But for us to come in, we have to bend over. We have to be broken, like Pastor Eric said. We have to know our own brokenness and confess it. We have to be ready to get low before the Lord and stay low. Look, this isn't a flattering point of view, especially when you're going through the door. Think about all the people behind you. Like, that's not flattering, but that's the point. Repentance isn't flattering. This isn't about me looking good. This is about me coming to the place of desperation by the help of the Holy Spirit who brings conviction. He exposes my heart to myself. So I realize I don't wanna stay on this side of that doorway. Whatever it takes, I'll get down on all fours, but I wanna go through. So I let go of all of it. I let go of all of it. 
every way of thinking, every way that you've thought the world works, you have to be ready to let it go, to set it down. Amen. You have to let him teach you from the ground up. Jesus, everything I thought was right, apparently I don't know. Yeah. Are you okay to say that? That you are not the God of your life, that you are not the one who determines your future. And if you did, it would be a mess. So we come up under who he says he is, and we say, Lord, I trust this is good news for me. And if I can get through this door, I'm going to see that when I've died to myself, the resurrection power of Jesus is so much better. The kingdom of God is so much more than anything I could have done if I had stayed on the other side of that door. I think it's interesting. I don't know that you can tell from this perspective. Throw that slide up one more time, please. Ruth, is there's a bench there to the left. Do you see that? Like some people might decide to just stay close to the kingdom, but not go all the way in. I just wanna challenge you. Oh, Holy Spirit, would the Holy Spirit expose your heart to yourself today? If there's any chance that you have been sitting on the bench close to the kingdom, it's near but you have refused in whatever ways only the spirit, only the spirit can come and put his finger on it like he did for that rich young ruler is you haven't bent. You haven't repented. You haven't come to that place of saying, Jesus, I, I am nothing. I cannot do this. I cannot do this without you. Reteach me how to be human. Reteach me how to be a man. Reteach me how to be a woman. Reteach me how to think, right? The Bible says, renew your thinking. That means the way I think on my own is not his way of thinking. There is a greater reality that only he can show me, but I have to put on humility and bow in order to get what he has for me. And this is the way of the kingdom. Once you get through that doorway, you don't get to stand up again. Right? Is there any version of the kingdom where you get to stand up in your pride again? No, he'll, he'll ask you to get right back down. And here's how I want to visual, and I'm just going to be a fool for the Lord right now. But here's what I think. I think if I could just help you visualize this. If I'm down here, and there's like an experience of the kingdom that's happening right here. And God's done it this way on purpose. He says, come all the way in, come low, because everything I'm doing is right here. It's the best you'll ever experience. It's right here. But if at any point I decide to stand up, I'm now out of that realm. And a lot of us have done this in our Christian lives. We came in this way. We had brokenness in our life. We knew our neediness for the Savior. And we came in this way, but somewhere along the way, we thought we knew a little better. We got maybe a little success under our belts or life took a turn we weren't expecting. And so to cope with it even, we stood back up. But now you're finding yourself out of the peace of God. You're now no longer in his peace you don't understand why. Now you no longer have the wisdom of God like you used to have and you're not sure why. You don't have the passion to worship like you used to have and you don't know why. You don't have the freedom. Jesus says he brings freedom. You're not experiencing freedom. Let me tell you why. The first place to start, it's the first place Jesus started is he says, repent. If you will get back down here, this is where you start. You get back down here and then you let him work in your heart, renewing you, changing you, filling you up. And the things that exist in this realm right here suddenly flood over you and you begin, man, it's lowly down here. Sometimes I get hurt and I have to forgive. Sometimes I suffer and I have to endure. But this is where the peace is. And this is where the comfort of the Holy Spirit is. And this is where my relationships, because you know how many relationships would get fixed if we would just get down here? This is where healthy, godly relationships exist, right here. This is the way of the kingdom. 
If you have never entered, Jesus says today, come and see. Taste and see that the Lord is good. If you think, well, Vanessa, that's all before the cross and resurrection. Jesus doesn't require that of us anymore. You're wrong, because if you keep reading in Acts, the very first sermon, Peter says, you know what you need to do? You need to repent. He says in Acts chapter three, he says, and this is his second sermon. He says, repent for times of refreshing will come on you. Where are those times of refreshing? Down here. This is, if you want to, some of you are worn out from doing life on your own terms. You are worn out from the striving. And he says, I want to pour out refreshing on you. But the old, it exists down here. So if you want to experience it, you got to lay it all down and come down low. That's where it is. Look, he told Nicodemus, you got to be born again. That was offensive. That broke the intelligence that Nicodemus thought he had. How can somebody be born again? Do you have to check your brain at the door, Vanessa, to be a Christian? Yes, you actually do. Now, some of the smartest people I know are believers. So you'll get incredible intelligence down here. But if you wanna walk into the kingdom with intelligence as your crown, he's gonna knock it off first. If you wanna come in with good living, Nicodemus was a religious person. How, how, why do I need to be born again? He's gonna knock off that crown first. He's gonna go after whatever the crown is on your head. And he's gonna ask you to lay it down, set it down, because you won't be able to enter with that, with that on your head. To leaders, if you have leadership potential, he's gonna tell you the first shall be last and the last will be first. So you gotta get down. He continues to do this. I'm just gonna go with these alarms and tell you every time you hear one of these alarms, you just hear the Holy Spirit saying, time's up, time's up, time's up. Let's get all the way in to the offended victim who comes and wants to enter the kingdom of God. He says, you're gonna have to turn the other cheek. You're gonna have to give your whole coat and your other coat to the crowds of fans who wanted the healing and the miracles. He says to them, eat my flesh and drink my blood. And you know what? They left. They walked away from the kingdom of God because it started to get weird. But the same Jesus who says, come to me, come and see the times now. I wanna release you from your prison. I wanna set you free from your oppression. I wanna heal your blindness. That same Jesus will offend you and say, but the only way to enter in is repentance. And so today we're gonna go, we're gonna leave by taking communion. And here's the invitation. Taste and see that the Lord is good. But as you come, I want your coming, when you come to take communion in a minute, and we have tables down here and upstairs, and you'll take the bread and dip it in the cup, and then you can decide if you wanna go back to your seat or pray at the altar with it. But in your coming... I want your coming to be a decision. I want your coming to be a response to this message that Lord, I'm gonna renew my decision to stay low. I'm gonna renew my commitment to do the kingdom down here, to let it go to every way I've built myself up, my thoughts up, my ways up. I'm gonna repent. God, I can't do this on my own. I don't have this in myself. There are some of you that have never done this. I want you to know this is your invitation today. This is Jesus saying, time's up, today's the day. Come all the way in. And as you come and you take communion today, this is your way of saying, Jesus, I decide I will eat your flesh and drink your blood. It doesn't make sense to the world's sensibilities but I recognize that your ways are higher than my ways. And so I'll come however you ask me to come. I'll come and do whatever you ask me to do because I want all the way in. Repent, turn to God because the kingdom of heaven is near. 
Would you stand with me? I'm going to close reading this scripture. thinking about that song we sang. I don't even know that it was on the order of service, so I don't think it was planned, but it must have been the Holy Spirit when we sang, you can have it all, Lord. Oh, the joy I found when I surrender my crowns. That's what it's, this isn't a hard word. This is good news. It's just so different than how our world has taught us to think, how our flesh wants to be. But if we'll submit to God's ways, we'll find there's so much goodness on the other side of this. So much joy, so much peace. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, thank you for hiding these things from those who think themselves wise and clever and for revealing them to the childlike. God, make us childlike. I tried to just be like a living example of that. You probably were embarrassed for me. That's fine. Like getting down on hands and knees, like just Lord, make us willing to be childlike before you so that it's a symbol of what's going on in our hearts. Then Jesus said, the context is amazing. So when you're ready to be childlike, this is what Jesus says, come to me, all of you who are weary, and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. We gotta do it his way. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I'm humble, he says, and I'm gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. As we head into communion, come in your own time. Don't feel rushed. You don't have to come just because the person next to you comes. But I want you to come unto Jesus with a new and fresh commitment that we're gonna live low. We're gonna live gentle and humble like he does. We're gonna live in a posture of repentance so that we can experience all that he's inviting us into. It's an invitation today. Amen. Lord, as we get ready to take of your body and your blood, we remember the high price that you paid for this moment, for this Kairos moment, where we could say to you, we receive you, all of you wholeheartedly. And Lord, would you have it all? Would you have every part of us? Lord, we give it to you. And we know that in doing that, we enter into a glorious kingdom that is eternal, that starts today and lasts forever. God, we just thank you for your goodness. Thank you, Lord. All right, when you're ready, come and take communion. You can have it all, Lord. Every part of my world. Take this life and breathe on. This heart that is.
Jesus, I surrender.